The New Testament book of Acts, and when you find the book of Acts, if you'll turn to chapter 7, I want to take you to the familiar story of Stephen for just a few minutes. As you know, Stephen is one of the first deacons, uh, original deacons that was elected and uh, chosen in Acts chapter 6, and he was also uh, evidently a tremendous teacher of the Word of God. And, uh, and actually, I want to talk to you today about the death of Stephen, the death of Stephen. It's found in Acts chapter 7, Acts chapter 7. While you're turning there, we'll begin reading a minute with uh, verse 54. Uh, now, some of you may be like me uh, when the preacher says, I sort of felt led of the Lord to talk about death. I'm tempted to get a little worried. Uh, is the Lord trying to tell me something to get my house in order, my life in order, or is someone about to die? Well, uh, we'll say more about that in a minute. And the truth is the Lord is trying to tell us something, amen? Because the truth is we're just, uh, uh, life is one, one heartbeat uh, from eternity and one breath away, amen? And so we want to think about the subject of how to face death, subject of dying. And I want you to look at with me in Acts chapter 7, and let me begin reading with verse 54, all right? Acts 7, beginning with verse 54. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth, which is a picture there of just uncontrollable rage. But he, that is Stephen, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God, and said, Behold, I see the heavens opened, and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice, and stopped their ears, and ran upon him with one accord, and cast him out of the city, and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet, whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God, and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. And Saul was consenting unto his death. And at that time there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and helling men and women, committing them to prison. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Let's pray together. And again, uh, would you just ask the Holy Spirit to take the word of God today and help you to see what you need to see and pray for your pastor as he seeks to deliver what we believe God's laid on our heart today. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Father, again, we do thank you for this opportunity to be together. And Lord, I believe we can already say it's been good to be in the house of the Lord, just uh, fellowshipping together, praying together, singing together. Lord, carrying one another's burdens, laughing together, rejoicing together, weeping together. But now, Lord, as we just help us, Lord, uh, we're human and, and sometimes our mind tends to wander. There's uh, different things going on throughout the day. Help us, Lord, to be able to focus on your word, O God, and we pray that the Holy Spirit will just speak to our hearts and challenge us today from the truth of your word, and we'll thank you and praise you in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now, it's obvious that Stephen did not die uh, from what we might call normal conditions, some type of disease. It wasn't an accidental death. Stephen was actually murdered or martyred out of opposition and persecution against the truth of God. Now, we, we, uh, there's always been opposition to the truth of God since the Garden of Eden, we understand that. Sometimes it's more severe than at other times. And opposition to the truth can lead to, to persecution, not just opposition, but some type of form or degree of persecution. And the reason I'm taking you to the, to the story of Stephen today is because we're living in times in our nation. We've had it pretty good. We've been spoiled rotten, to just put it very plainly. But many are concerned because the opposition to the truth of God 
is increasingly becoming stronger and stronger and more severe in our society. Would you agree with that? It's obvious. And many are concerned, even through this epidemic we're going through, that there's been some overreach. Well, there's no, there's no doubt about it in, in, that uh, some of our political leaders, whether local, statewide, nationally, have overreached their authority. And many believe that this could very well be, and we don't know, and nobody knows, only God knows, that this could be the very beginning of some type of not just opposition, but persecution against the, the churches and Christianity. And believe me, there are some uh, out there, we hope they're in a, a very small minority. If they had their way, believe me, we would be under persecution today, even in America. So people say, well, what can we do? How can we pre prepare? Because we, we don't know what's coming. We really don't. And, and naturally, we, hope for the, we pray for the rapture and we hope for the best. And God's merciful. Well, the best advice I can give you is get in the Word of God, find stories like this one with Stephen, and, and they're all through the Bible from beginning to end, and see how God blessed, how what God did in their lives. And that's a whole different message. Maybe we'll come back to this story later and, and, and learn well, what, what, how, how did Stephen and how did these early Christians deal with, with opposition and persecution? And by the way, you can, you, you can, today you can go read testimonies in books. How are Christians dealing with severe persecution in many parts of the world today? Amen? So just find out. And, and, and you find out that God's grace is sufficient no matter what we have to deal with on a national scale or family scale or even in your own personal life. Whatever it is, God's grace is sufficient. Amen? Now, statistics tell us that, it, that five are just in America, the 50 states of the United States, that somewhere between five, six, or seven people die every minute in the United States. Five, six, seven people on an average die every minute somewhere in the United States. That's somewhere between three and 400 people every hour. Every hour in the United States, on an average, somewhere between three and 400 people die. That means since we started this service at 9 o'clock, somewhere between 150 to 200 people somewhere in the United States have died. Nearly 8,000 people a year uh, daily, 8,000 people, uh, I'm sorry, a year daily, 8,000 people daily die in the United States. That's between three or 400 an hour. Now, we know that, we know death, and that reminds us. And by the way, I'm going to give you a lot of verse references today. You may want to jot them down, you may not. You're probably familiar with all of them. We don't have time to look them all up. The Apostle James tells us in James chapter 4, verse 13, what is your life? It is even a vapor. It just, it's here and it's gone. Proverbs 27, 1, the writer of Proverbs said, Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. Uh, the psalmist tells us in Psalms 90 that our, our years are as a tale that is told. They come and fly away just that quickly. Hebrews 9, 27, the writer of Hebrews said, It is appointed unto man once to die, but that's not the end. After this is the judgment. So these verses and many others remind us of the certainty of death and the uncertainty of life and so forth. And people die every day, and, and, and we know the statistics and so forth. And, uh, but I want you to notice here in, in this story, this man died because he was martyred. He was martyred for the cause of Christ. And by the way, all those approximately on an average of 8,000 people that die every year in America, they all don't die of COVID-19 either, okay? And, and I'm not making light of that. By the way, I'm not, I don't in any way want to say anything to imply that I'm being insensitive or morbid about death, but we just need to face reality. There's all types of death and forms of death and so forth, and people are dying all around us, and we understand that. So how do we deal with it? Well, I want you to notice two or three things as we look at the death of Stephen today. First of all, I want you to notice in the last verse of Acts chapter 7, in the last verse of Acts chapter 7, and matter of fact, the last phrase of Acts chapter 7 and verse 60 says, He fell asleep. Stephen fell asleep. Wow. You know, isn't that, isn't that a comforting thought? Matter of fact, I, I, and I'm not trying to be funny, but I, I, when I read that, I almost want to just whisper, Shh, he fell asleep. He fell asleep. But I'm not supposed to be whispering. I'm supposed to be preaching and hammering and spitting and slobbering and pounding the pulpit. Amen. 
he fell asleep. Isn't sleep a wonderful gift of God? You know, the psalmist tells us in Psalms 127, verse 2, that God giveth his beloved sleep. Did you know a good night's sleep is a gift of the mercy and grace of God? And all through the Bible, God pictures dying as going to sleep. For instance, that wonderful passage in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18, that talk about the rapture two or three times there. It talks about those who have, are asleep, and this is important, asleep in Jesus. And there he's comforting those Christians that are still living, that your loved ones who have died and gone on and are asleep in Jesus, they, they've not missed out on anything. We're all going to be joined together one day. In 1 Corinthians 15, 51, he talks about, hey, we shall not all sleep. Some of us will maybe have the privilege of being in the rapture. We shall not all sleep or die physically, but one thing about it, if you know Jesus, you're going to be changed and transformed into his holiness one day. And all through Job, in Job chapter 19, verse 25, talked about, Though I die and be buried, and my, and my body be eaten by worms and decay, I will stand on this earth in my flesh one day and see my Redeemer. David said in Psalm 17, verse 15, I will awake in his likeness one day. Uh, Daniel, in Daniel 12, verse 2, said, Those that sleep in the dust will awake one day, and, uh, and so forth. I want you to uh, think with me for a moment. You know, sleep, uh, as we say, why, why does God so many times in the Bible picture dying as just going to sleep? Well, there's many reasons for that, and maybe that could be a message in itself, but one of the reasons I believe is, is because we're, we're familiar with going to sleep, right? Now, I'm not too familiar with dying. It's never, I've never experienced that. How about you? And we know, and again, I'm not trying to be insensitive and make light, but, and that's one of the reasons we, we don't even like to talk about dying because, you know, it's just, even though we know the Lord and we, we have most confidence going to be with Him, but we experience sleep every day of our lives, don't we? Matter of fact, matter of fact God even blesses some of you with sleep during church. You can just go right to sleep. <laughs> Isn't that terrible? No, I'll, I'll take the blame for that. I, I bore you to death, put you to sleep. The Lord didn't do that. I'll take the blame for that, okay? Remember, remember, remember John chapter 11, three times in the New Testament, uh, uh, we, we have stories of where Jesus raised someone from the dead and woke them up. John chapter 11, you're familiar with that, Lazarus, they got, Jesus got word that Lazarus was sick and, and Lazarus died and Jesus, then, and, and Jesus said to his disciples, he said, hey, hey Lazarus is sleeping, let's go visit him. And, and, the, and some of the disciples who didn't want to go because they knew that there was persecution and, and what, their lives might be in danger, they said, well, Jesus, if Lazarus is sleeping, man, if the pastor's asleep, leave him alone. Don't call him. My goodness, great. If Lazarus is sleeping, he needs his rest. And, and, and Jesus said, Lazarus is dead. Well, Jesus, make up your mind. Is he sleeping or is he dead? You mean he was sleeping and he died? And Jesus said, I'm going to go wake him up. So he, he meant there, that he, and he did, didn't he? And, and he went to that tomb, and they, they opened it up, and Jesus just said, and I don't know if he, we, we assume he shouted, Jesus just said, Lazarus, rise, come forth. And he woke him up out of that sleep. Now I want you to turn with, that's one example, but uh, we don't know how many, but you ever think about this, John, the Apostle John said if everything was put in writing that Jesus did, even during his three years of ministry, well, I don't, I'm not sure the world could contain the books that would have to be written. But we have at least three. I want you to turn to the Gospel of Luke with me. Gospel of Luke chapter 7. The Gospel of Luke chapter 7. And God pictures sleep, dying as just going to sleep. And uh, uh, look at Luke chapter 7. And uh, beginning with verse 11. Luke chapter 7, beginning with verse 11. Got your place? Luke 7, verse 11. And it came to pass the, uh, the day after that he, Jesus, went into a city called Nain. And many of his disciples went with him and much people. So this was a very public thing here now. Verse 12 says, Now when Jesus came nigh to the gate of the city, that's the town square, public, Behold, there was a dead man carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. So here's a widow, and her only son has died. 
And much people of the city was with her. Here is probably a funeral service taking place. And verse 13 of Luke 7 says, And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her, and said unto her, Weep not, weep not. And he came and touched the bier, or the coffin, and they that bare him stood still, and he said, Young man, I say unto thee, Arise. And he that was dead set up and began to speak, and he delivered him to his mother. Now, what in the world is God trying to teach us there? Now, again, I'm not trying to be insensitive. But like you, I'm sure, many of you, I've stood beside in, in many caskets over the year and looked down at the body of that loved one. Elderly, youth, children, babies. And, and, and this thought's gone through my mind on many occasions. They just look like they're sleeping. It looks like I could just reach out there and nudge them a little bit and they would just open their eyes and, and communicate with me. But you know you can't do that. But Jesus can. Amen. <laughs> what a demonstration of who Jesus really is. His power, His deity. All Jesus had to say was, wake up. Nudge them a little bit. Jesus can do that. You say, well, why doesn't he do it all the time? Well, God's way is the best way. God knows one day he's going to do that. Amen? But now watch this. You're in the Gospel of Luke. Look at Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8, beginning with verse 40. Luke chapter 8. Now, stay with me now. We're talking about Stephen just fell asleep. He just went to sleep. What a beautiful picture. And uh, in Luke chapter 8, verse 40... It came to pass that when Jesus was returned, uh, Luke 8, verse 40, it came to pass when Jesus returned, the people gladly received him, for they were all waiting for him. And behold, there came a man named Jairus, and he was a ruler of the synagogue, and he fell down at Jesus' feet and besought him that he would come into his house, for he had one daughter, and she was about 12 years of age, and she lay a dying. And so uh, Jesus starts going to this man's house. And along the way, the next few verses tell us about a woman who had an issue with her blood and she touched the hem of Jesus' garment, garment and she got healed. But now let's pick up with the story down in verse uh, 49. Verse 49 of Luke 8 says, And while he yet spake, there cometh one from the ruler of the synagogue's house, saying to him, Thy daughter is dead. She's passed away. Trouble not the master. Wow. Now, you know, that would be a normal thing to say, wouldn't it? Just, you know, there's no, we don't, no need to call the, no need to, you know, don't trouble Jesus any longer. She's already passed away. But when Jesus heard it, he answered, saying, Fear not, believe only, and she shall be made whole. And when he came into the house, he suffered no man to go in, say Peter, James, and John, and the father and mother, mother of the maiden. And all wept and bewailed, but he said, Weep not, she's not dead, but sleepeth. Now, you know what? Was Jesus lying? Well, we know he wasn't lying. Was she really dead? Yes, she was dead. But from, Jesus, from our perspective, human perspective, yes, she's dead. But from God's perspective, she's only asleep. Oh, if by faith we could just see things from God's perspective. Amen? Now watch this, verse 53. And they laughed him to scorn, knowing that she was dead. And he put them all out, verse 55, and took her by the hand and said, Maid, or child, arise. Now watch verse 55. Verse 55 is important. And her spirit came again, and she arose straightway, and he commanded to give her something to eat. And her parents were astonished, but he charged them that they should tell no man what was done. Now that just sounds so Simple, just so. It's like waking up in the morning and, and, and I'm the kind of person, I don't like to eat when I first get up. I like my coffee and maybe a piece of toast. And, and man, if you mention eggs when I first, I'm rolling out of bed, get out of bed, the eggs are, oh, oh my goodness gracious, a lot. I got to get up and get my coffee and eat a piece of toast and stir around, maybe eat a bowl of cereal. And then about 10 o'clock or 10.30, man, I'm ready to go to Cracker Barrel. You know what I mean? But, uh, 
But I hear Jesus woke her up and said, she'd been sick, she probably hadn't had a good meal now. It just sounds so practical and so simple. I'm just simply trying to remind, and this is what Jesus, and I, I wonder how many, how many times was this done during Jesus' three years of ministry? Folks, this is our Savior. This is the God we serve today. The impossible with us, the unimaginable. They were astonished. How in the world? We know this girl was dead. And Jesus, you just spoke. You just touched her. It's like waking somebody up from sleep. Now go back with me to Acts chapter 7. And uh, when we kind of look at dying from Jesus' perspective, it, it does help us a little bit, doesn't it? To kind of see that kind of takes the sting and the fear and the dread out of it. Go back to Acts chapter 7, and the end of verse 60 says that he fell asleep. But I want you to notice something he said and saw before he fell asleep. Okay? First of all, in Acts chapter 7, going back to verse 55, verse 55 of Acts chapter 7, but Stephen, been full of the Holy Spirit, and by the way, when I tell you to read stories like this to see how they, how they handle opposition and persecution, well, there's, you can start your list with that one. He was under the control of the Holy Spirit. That's a good thing to have when you're going through persecution, isn't it? So we go through stories like this and make a list of how did they deal with it? How did they respond? <clears throat> but Stephen, been full of the Holy Ghost, looked steadfastly into heaven. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a good, that's a good direction to be looking, amen, when you're about to be stoned to death. He looked steadfastly into heaven, and he saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. Our theme verse says Jesus, saw for the joy that was beyond the cross, endured the cross and the shame, and his seated position at the right hand of the throne of God. And I can't help but wonder, yet, yet precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of His saints. Does Jesus stand up to give you a welcome home? Hallelujah, what a picture. He said, I saw Jesus standing at the right hand of God and said, Behold, He said, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Well, boy, that's all it took. That lit the powder keg and they, were, they had so much rage, they threw Him out of the city in stone. What in the what Stephen saw? He saw the heavens open. He saw Jesus standing to welcome him home. And look what he said over in verse 59. And as they were stoning Stephen, while Stephen was called praying, Stephen said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. You know the same thing Jesus said on the cross? One of the seven sayings of Jesus. Jesus is a good example to follow, isn't he? Now, here's what I'm trying to make sure we understand. When God says dying is going to sleep, He's talking about the body. The body goes to sleep, but the spirit leaves the body. The spirit doesn't go to sleep. The real you, the soul, the spirit that lives in that body. He, now, we identify with the body. The body's precious to us. And, and God is saying, look, look, the body's just going to sleep for a while. And by the way, Jesus said in John, Jesus himself said in John chapter 5, verses 28 and 29, one day the same voice that said, Lazarus, come forth, little maid, rise up, son, rise up, that same voice is going to cry, and every grave is going to open, and everybody is going to come out of the tomb, lost or saved, and give an account to God and stand before their Creator one day. Now, Jesus said that. The voice of God. He can not only raise one, He can raise everybody. But it's the body that goes to sleep. Listen to this. The Apostle James said, James 2 verse 26, James 2 verse 26, the body without the spirit is dead. James right there gives us a definition of physical death. It's a separation of you from your body. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, this body's just a tent, just a temporary tent. Thank God for it. God made a pretty good tent, didn't He, when He made this for life down here. This is the tent. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. To be, to be living in this body is to be absent from the Lord, Paul teaches us. But to leave, the, the body goes to sleep. But James said the spirit, the soul, the real you leaves the body 
and you go into eternity. If you know the Lord, you go to be with Him. Solomon said the same thing, Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 7, that the man dies, his body goes back to the dust, and his spirit goes back to the God that gave him life. Remember we read in Luke chapter 8 that when God raised the 12-year-old girl of the ruler, that her spirit came back into her. See, God, and, and when Jesus comes back, he's bringing the, 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 the loved ones with him, and they'll be reunited with the body, and, and, and all those things will happen. My goodness, so many things. Some of them we understand a little bit, some we don't. We have our questions. <clears throat> but Jane, but, but Stephen realized that my body may go to sleep, but I'm going to be with Jesus, amen. To be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. <clears throat> now, how do we know that? In Luke chapter 23, Jesus has been crucified between two thieves. And one of them, at one point, they both were opposing Jesus and ridiculing Jesus. One of them, right there on the cross, the whole, he, he saw the truth with a repentant heart. I believe he trusted Christ as his Savior. And, that, and Jesus said, and, and he said, hey, Jesus, when you come back, you know what? He believed Jesus was coming back, amen, and going to set up a kingdom. He said, would you remember me? And Jesus said, oh, I'm not going to remember you in the future. Today, today thou shalt be with me in paradise, amen. That was heaven. Now, somebody asked an evangelist one time on a talk show, I remember hearing this, he said, and they were kind of laughing, making fun of it. said, well, all this business about heaven, Stephen's, you know, like we just read, Stephen saw the heavens open, and Paul said, I knew a man that went up all the way to the, to the third heaven. Said, Where is heaven? And I was waiting to see what this evangelist said, because George said, well, it's up north somewhere. I always thought it was down south, but it's up north, you know. And the uh, evangelist said, well, I don't know exactly where heaven is. I have my opinions, but I know this. Heaven is wherever Jesus is, and that's all I need to know. Amen. Heaven is wherever Jesus is. I want you to turn with me real quick back to the Gospel of Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16 we have a story that Jesus gave about two men that died. One was named Lazarus, and the other one we don't know his name. The Bible just says he was a very one, Lazarus was a poor man, and 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 then the rich man. And what I'm trying to get you to see is when God says death is sleep, He's not talking about when you die you just go into some unconscious state. Some some call it the doctrine of soul sleep. The body goes to sleep, but the spirit, the soul, the real you goes into eternity. And there's only two places. There's no limbo, hobo, purgatory, or any other place. You either go to heaven or hell, according to Jesus. And I think I'm just going to listen to Jesus. Amen. If you're a born-again believer, if you die in Jesus, if you die in Christ, then like Stephen, you go to be with Jesus. Look at this story in Luke chapter 16, verse 19. Luke chapter 16, verse 19. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen, and he fired sumptuously every day. God was good to him, wasn't he? Maybe he earned all that honestly. We don't know. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which laid at his gate full of sores, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried, watch this, have you ever noticed that? And was carried by the angels. Wow. I don't know. I've never, I know people say they died and come back and wrote books. And I, I don't know, folk. I, and now I know some of you are going to meet me after church and say, well, no, I believe so, and that's all right. You believe what you want. I just don't know. I, I'm just going to stick, you know, just read my Bible and, and all that. I know Paul said, I went to heaven and came back. And you just got to be careful, you know, and so forth. But I wonder, when, when Stephen said, when Stephen said, oh, I saw the heavens open, I saw Jesus stand, and I said, oh, Lord Jesus, just re I, I welcome my spirit. I wonder if you have an angelic escort. Did you know to get from here to heaven, you've got to go through Satan's domain? Whew. I wonder if there's a, you know, <laughs> kind of feel like a big shot right now, you know. My Heavenly Father sends all those angels down there and says, Come on, Frank, we're just going to escort you right on through. And Satan and all his demons are just going to see a, what a demonstration of God's almighty grace can do. 
take you, delivered you out of hell, going to take you right through Satan's domain and take you right into the presence of an absolutely holy God. Now, folk, if that's not mercy and grace, tell me what is. Amen? The beggar died, and angels escorted him into Abraham's bosom, which we believe is a Hebrew expression for paradise, place of comfort, heaven. Verse 22 says, The rich man also died and was buried, and in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments. His spirit wasn't asleep. His soul wasn't asleep. Folk, there are people who are consciously in torments of hell right now because they died physically without knowing Jesus Christ as their Savior and they're going to spend an eternity in hell. Now that's what Jesus is teaching here. And verse 24 says, And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things and likewise Lazarus the evil things and now he is comforted. Lazarus wasn't asleep somewhere. Oh, his body, that old body, that old sore body that, that even stunk and licked by the dogs and all. Oh, it was probably thrown in the dump somewhere and burned. I don't know what they did with it. It may have gone to sleep, but Lazarus, Lazarus is more awake than he'd ever been. Amen. Lazarus is with Jesus. And then he goes, and by the way, before, and Abraham said in verse 29, or in this man in hell in verse 27 said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren or brothers that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. And Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And, and, and he said, But Abraham, if somebody went back from the dead, they will repent. They will repent. He knew why he was in hell, because he refused to repent of his sin and believe the gospel and get saved. And he said unto him, If they will not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. He said, Listen, if you won't believe the word of God, you won't believe it if I raise somebody from the dead. And he, and he, and he proved that. He raised another Lazarus from the dead in John chapter 11. And did everybody believe? No, they just tried to kill Kill him again. Get rid of him. It's, it's not a head problem. It's a heart problem. If you're not willing to believe the Word of God, then it wouldn't matter what God did. You're not going to believe. Listen. Stephen fell asleep. His body went to sleep. And one day God's going to wake that up, give him a new body. But his spirit went to be with Jesus. <laughs> Jesus, angelic escort to heaven. And Jesus welcomed Stephen into his presence. The third thing, and I'll just mention this, and you've got to have three points to a sermon, folks, so stay with me one more minute. Not only did Stephen fall asleep, and did he ask, he committed, he, he wasn't asking Jesus to save him. What he was saying was, Lord Jesus, I'm just, I'm, I'm just committing my spirit to you. I know you're going to welcome me home to be with you. What peace and assurance that only God can give you when that moment comes to die. But the third thing is, Stephen even ministered in his death. He ministered in his death because he said, remember he prayed and said, Father, don't hold this sin against them. Lord, they need forgiveness. They just don't, Lord, they're going to have to be held. Jesus said the same thing, Father, forgive them for they know not what to do. He wasn't saying, oh, just overlook it, don't hold them accountable. He said, no, they need, they need forgiveness. They need forgiveness. Or they're not going to be ushered into heaven, they're going to spend eternity in hell. And there was a young man there by the name of Saul who was holding the coats, the garments of those who were throwing the stones. And later on, in Acts chapter 9, that same young man saw, he saw a little glimpse of what Stephen saw. He saw the glory of Jesus when God knocked him down to the dust of the ground. And in Acts chapter 22, when Paul's given his testimony, he said, you know what? He said, I was there. I was there when your martyr, Stephen, was stoned to death. And by the way, I, I consented, to it, consented to it. I, I matter of fact, I was happy. I was rejoicing. And yet, something was planted. I saw how that man died, how he faced death. I saw something that I've never been able to get out of my mind and heart. A seed was planted in Saul's heart. 
You know, our loved ones die. Did a doctor see something? Did a nurse hear something? Was a piece of gospel literature left? Was a seed planted? Paul said in Philippians chapter 1, I just want Jesus to be magnified, whether I'm living or dying. And you know what? We can live for Jesus. We can serve Jesus like Stephen did. And even in God's timing of things, even in our death, God can use us to minister and to serve and plant a seed. God's ways are truly the best ways, aren't they? I'll close with this. There are so many verses. John chapter 14, Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. Now, folk, if we're not careful, we get more concerned about the place than we do the person, Jesus. Jesus said, I'll come again. And the thing that excited Stephen wasn't so much the streets of gold and all that. And I understand. I, I get excited. But, you know, my goodness gracious, if, 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 if pavement's made out of gold, what must heaven be like? Amen. But what's really important about heaven is Jesus is going to be there, folk. Jesus. In Revelation chapter 14 and verse 13, Revelation 14 verse 13, the writer said, hey, blessed are they that die in the Lord, for they shall find rest, and their labors cease, and their works, and their rewards shall follow them. Oh, listen, what a blessing. The, the psalmist said, precious in the sight of the Lord. Precious. Now, from our perspective, their sadness, their grief, they made great lamentation over the death of Stephen. They, Steve, they missed him. Their hearts were knit together. But oh, from God's perspective, and from that loved one's perspective that went to heaven, it's a time of joy. Time of joy. Let me ask you a question this morning. Are you ready? First of all, do you truly know Jesus Christ as your Savior? Have you truly repented? Not, I'm not asking if you're a church member, if you've been baptized. We could go down the list of many, many good things. But has there ever been a time in your life when you, with a repentant heart, acknowledge your sin and your faith and trust is in Jesus and Jesus alone? He died on that old rugged cross for you, shed his blood for your sins, was buried and rose again. Only Jesus, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, shall be saved. Is your trust in Jesus and Jesus alone? And second of all, is everything okay between you and your heavenly Father? Are you faithful serving Him? And, and, and you know, one day we're going to see Jesus. We, we, I wish we could be perfect in this life, but we'll be perfect one day when we see Jesus. If He chose to call you home today, are you ready? Are you ready to meet Him? Father, speak to our hearts today. Oh, God, speak to our... We don't know what we're going to have to face in this old world. One day, Lord, if we're not living till the rapture takes place, we're all going to die, whether it's accidental, disease, COVID-19, or some, Lord, even while I've been preaching, there have been Christians martyred somewhere in this world, no doubt. And so God, makes, help us to make sure we're ready. And we know when that time comes, oh God, just like with Stephen, your grace is sufficient. And so, Father, we just pray today that the Holy Spirit will use this message to challenge our hearts, to comfort us in the days and weeks to come. And Lord, if there would happen to be anyone listening who truly has never repented of their sin and trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior, may they come to Jesus today. Just come to Jesus and repent of their sin, and call upon the Lord to forgive them and be their Savior. And Father, we'll thank you and praise you for all that you do. In Jesus' precious name, we pray. And all the Lord's people said, Amen. Thank you for being here today. Again, if we can help you at all, please let us know if there's anything at all we can do for you. God bless you. Be careful going home, and be in prayer for each other throughout the day.